What is going on, everybody? Bobby Fire with my guys, Jake Rohde and Eric Sheetaber. We are going to be talking a little bit more about MLB strategy. Uh, we did a long video last time. This will be a little bit shorter. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk, use the opening day slate as sort of just like a, an example of maybe putting some of those things we talked about before into practice, talk a little bit about cont contest selection, how you want to play lineups a little bit differently, uh, whether or not you need to fully stick, like, like in, you know, whether you want to stack in, in cash games or, or in, in a smaller field tournaments, things like that. Um, but uh, guys, good to have you and let's get into it. I'm going to share my screen and we'll uh, just talk about the opening day slate and, uh, you know, maybe starting off with Rody. This is like, for, for example, this is obviously a big buy in, not a huge field, 600 person tournament. I, I would consider like a really large field to be over a thousand people. If you're a beginner, I would recommend playing single entry tournaments and trying to keep it less than a couple hundred uh, people in, the, in those tournaments. You'll find that you can be much more competitive. I know the sites offer for beginners uh, some contests like that. I'm just using this as an example, but Rody, talk a little bit about, you know, sort of more. We, we talked about the full stacking. We know you and where you and Sheet stand on that whole thing. Um, but what I was going to ask, like, is, you know, if you're playing a single entry or a three entry with 20 total players, let's say, or 50 total players, less than a hundred, let's say, uh, you, wouldn't you find yourself maybe veering away from some stacks and combining, you know, a three, three, two or something like that. Wouldn't that make more sense in that type of a tournament field and, uh, talk a little bit about, you know, that, and then sort of the ways that, you know, is there, is there positions you like to stack? We know that outfield usually has the most value. So do you want to try and see if you can stack the infield? I know that's something I like to do. Just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, basically for the smaller field, I mean, a lot of people do really well playing like a cash lineup base. Like you said, like maybe more of like a smaller stacks or getting some of those core guys like a 3-3-2 you can do. Um, I still find a lot of the upside in like the 5-3 stack. Like if, if we hit the home run on the 5-3 stack, like you're – well, you're going to score a lot of points, mm -hmm. I think, in baseball. If you get that team when Toronto goes off for 21 runs, mm -hmm. you got five guys in that game. You ran it back with three cheap Pirates, and they they had a game seven to nine runs, and two guys hit two homers or something, and you got those guys in a cheap combo stack. Th then you kind of get, you know, you kind of get where you're, you're way ahead of the field unless you guys hit those three, three, two stacks, right? So I tend to either win it or lose it based on the – Five three stacking or five two one or five one one. You could do if you want to try to get three of the guys right. I, I don't mind that strategy in smaller field. I I usually play some cash in um in uh MLB. I think early season cash is a little okay. I mm -hmm. tend to go more GPP focus now. Um, so I don't even think I'm going to get to cash this year. But if you're doing it early, I I don't run, mind running some of the savers, some optimals we got now. They look good for cash or getting some of the cash players in. Um, if we show those later, we can maybe show some of that later, but yep. um, they look pretty good for smaller field. I usually play single entry, smaller field stuff, you know, single entry double ups. If you're in the cash market, if you're into the GPPs, you know, tend to get that stack for that upside. I, I really do like, but I know Bobby does the three, three twos a lot and, and you can get, you can get good hitters on all those plays a lot better and uh, get good upside for those live final tickets and qualifiers. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, I think that in cash, you can always mini stack. I do think in general, you, you don't need to worry about stacking in cash is my thing. I also, we don't talk as much about cash. I'm just sort of throwing it out there. So I do think you want sort of like a general baseline, especially when it comes to pitching. Like I might play a very, you know, the two most popular pitchers that I have no problem with it because I can play a lineup that's, you know, 1% owned and I can stack it in a way that it's going to be 0.1% owned to win a big tournament. Eric, how do you feel like it, 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 the way you play? I know you sort of hand and hand enter, and then you'll 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 maybe be able to do a twenty entry or a thirty entry sometimes on certain tournaments. Do you are you are we always going with the stacks, or is it, if 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 you were playing a three max, let's say, or if you're only playing one one big buy in, but there was only a hundred people in that tournament, or do you just not mess around with that stuff? But if you if you did, you, you it would make more sense logically, right, to maybe not be so much on the full stacking side of things. Well, I, I just still have just too much respect for the way correlation works in baseball mm. to, to abandon the stacks. For me, it would be more, it would be less a function of the, the, the field size and more a function of, of the slate size. Mm -hmm. um, if there's like a, a, you know, a three, a three game slate or a four game slate, I would be much less stingy about making sure that I had a, you know, I had a stack in there. Right. Um, but but in, in, for me, at least on the bigger fields, um, I'll, I mean, on DraftKings, it's very hard for me to to not play five man stacks in in full fields. And the thing about about baseball is, for those of you that are just starting out and and, and learned in football and 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 basketball, well, not so much football, but 
basketball with like different slate sizes, small slate sizes. They're very, it's very rare that there are small slates in baseball. I mean, you, you do get like everybody playing pretty much every day. Um, mm-hmm. There are some, you know, there was one day where, where that usually has like some, some split slates maybe, mm-hmm. um, but the, you usually do get full stacks, uh, excuse me, full slate. So I'm just, I'm just a little different. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I just always like to try to get those five man stacks in if I can possibly can. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I completely understand. Um, again, I, I think at certain times you could argue for, against it in, in smaller fields and stuff. Um, as, but I, I think as a baseline, that absolutely makes sense. And one, you know, just talking about types of stacks, I really love, you know, what we were, what I was doing with the White Sox last year was I liked playing them as a five man stack because I could stack the infield and you're going to have better plays in the outfield on most days than you will any other position. So when you come up with a viable stack with a lot of power that you can use and then pick pick and choose your favorite outfielders that are all in great spots or the cheapest outfielders, that's usually where the most value is as well, outside of the minimum cost catcher that day, which you can always do that as well. But I, I tend to like to go and try and build my stacks and as much as possible, leave my outfield spots open for the guys I feel have the most upside uh, on that slate. Bobby, Bobby, talk, Bobby, talk a little more about that because there were so many slates la- and 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 last year where you had these all those baltimore uh mm-hmm. outfielders that were all sub 3k that all right. look really good like every single day and and this is something that 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 you've been re- you just, i think it must have come naturally to you because as for me i'm still just i'm really confused about which are the days that you're supposed to you know uh, you know, uh, punt, not a punt, but pay down at, at, at outfield versus the types of days where he's supposed to pay down in the infield and when he's supposed to stack in, in, in the infield versus the outfield. I just don't, I can't quite seem to, to catch that part of it. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. And, and a lot of times what I would do in those situations where I was mentioning the White Sox as an example, I'll use those cheap outfielders from the, from the Orioles as my secondary mini stack. Um, that's what I like to do a lot. And you're getting great plays, you know, batting two through four who are costing, you know, let's say they cost 2,700 each that day because their overall season numbers are terrible, but they're facing, let's say Matt Harvey. Well, I guess they, he was a pitching for them actually. Um, but let's say they're, you're, you're facing a terrible pitcher in Baltimore, a great hitters park and it's 80 degrees out with, and it's humid. You, you, you want to get exposure to that, but what most people do is they'll go and fully stack that team. I will take my, my pieces and then I'll, I'll, I'll mix it in with my other, my other stack that I'm using. And I don't think it's, there's no rule about having to stack the infield, but usually there's the most options available at, at out, most good options are available are at outfield and first base. But again, you just have so many more guys playing in the outfield. So I, I think there's always like it, I'm very happy to include outfielders in my stack. I, I didn't want to say it like that, but if I can find any way to not do it, I want to try and take that chance because I, the best hitters in baseball, I mean, just look at the pricing. We can use that as a, as an example. You have, you have Matt Holson, who's, who's 5,700. You have Altuve, who's expensive on the infield, but mostly then you see the drop off in the outfield. You've got, you know, a million good players at, a, at, at all the way down in the, the medium four Ks and the other positions might only have like two or three guys who would be semi cash game viable or safe ish plays, which nobody's really safe in baseball, but in general, that's just the way that I try to do it. I, I don't want to include popular cheap outfielders as a part of a chalky stack. I like to use them as a part of a stack. That's not chalky, or I like to use them as a mini stack and leave that and not, not use, not go over the full stacking route. Does that make sense at all? Uh, Sheets and roadie at all. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to, to to quantify without using an exact example of a specific slate. I'll do it as we go along throughout the season, but that's the way that I try to look to build different or get different in my stacks. Um, is by you know, and again, I still think you're 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 doing a good job because you're getting the the best plays are going to be in the outfield, and uh, the more I can stay away from using use one or less of my outfield spots, I'm going to always try to do that. So, let, me, let me ask. Let me ask Bobby. Let me ask you another couple other questions like that because again, Bobby, you you do. Just, you know, you do a tremendous job, you know, hand building, right? Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, I know Rody does uses, uh, you know, uh, RGHQ a lot, and I used RGHQ, and then it's just a little Sabersim to help with my lineup construction. And when, when you, when you use an optimizer, whether it be, you know, Roto Grinders or lineup eight or, or, or Sabersim or whatever, 
you have this idea, this, the, these rules that you need to put in, right? And, and I remember, like Saberson, you Saberson, they, they, you don't really need to, they kind of do it for you. But if you use roto grinders, you know, you can, they, they make it also easier for you. You know, they, they, you, you set these, these general, these rules that for stacking and things like that. So when you like hand build, are there anything that you'll do with respect to, I don't know, like, I know some people are so greedy that they'll say, I don't want anybody in the seven, eight, nine. I know people that still do that, you know, right. I don't want anybody to 789 uh, and, and let's see what I get, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And what you do is you end up just, you know, give, probably costing yourself some good low owned possibilities um, or whatever. Talk about how you handle like that whole construction thing. When you hand build, you know, like what type of rules do you at least think about? What type do you actually use? And why, why don't you talk about that a little yeah. bit? Yeah, no, so I, I generally like to have gaps between my hitters on DraftKings. On FanDuel, I prefer them to be in order because the correlation means a lot more over there because the runs in RBIs um, are much more valuable. There's, you know, 60% more valuable than they are on DraftKings. So I, I tend to look for gaps like that. I know other people like to go in, in some sort of, uh, you know, in, in some order, which, I, again, I think is right on FanDuel. I don't think it's right on DraftKings. And if you have a powerful hitter in your 7, 8, or 9 spot, I think taking a chance on that guy is really, really makes a lot of sense because you're automatically going to be getting different than the other 20% of the people who are playing the stacks because only 1% of them or 2% of them are going to, going to include that guy. And if they do, they're almost, they, they're, they're batting the, playing the eight, seven or eight hitter. They're almost always playing the one hitter. So sometimes what I'll do is a stack, like a two, four, six, eight, you know what I mean? Like just so yeah. I can get a little, even a little extra different. Um, but again, I would like that guy to have power or speed upside. That's the one thing I want to try to always jam home is like the A's for all these years with Jed Lowry, who actually showed a little bit more power last year. But it's really not like and, and people won tournaments with him. Sure, it's going to happen sometimes when the team's going off for 17 runs. But it's just he's so much worse of a play than a guy like I'm trying to think of an example from the A's from last year, but uh, you know, then a guy, then a guy who has a bunch of power, but hits, is a 200 hitter. I don't care about how, what the guy hits for average. I don't care about how many RBIs he has. I, I, if he's hitting, if he's doing it all with singles, you're that's not, that's going to be a loss on that position. You're going to lose at second base. If you're going to take a guy who's just a singles hitter. And so I will try to include the, the, the guy with the, the guys with the ISO above 200 at the bottom of the order, much more than I would a guy at 140 in the heart of the order. Um, Rody, does that make sense to you at all? Yeah, I definitely like like exactly what you said, you know, get that power speed upside, you know, and definitely doing the stacks where you're not doing the top, you know, seven, eight, nine hitters. Like, I mean, you're not just fading them like other people seem to do, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, even when I run some saber sim, I actually I know you had it up a second ago. Uh, you gotta go to the date. Unfortunately, we don't oh you can get to that you can get yeah, to this you just gotta change the date in the top to get to yeah, this, this that's not slate. Bad. That. they do yeah. have projections and in some orders of batters even uh, yeah. uh projected orders of batters um so i did run some satellites i know you wanted me to talk about some satellites mm -hmm. qualifier tickets and stuff i did run some single entry 11 to 100 person satellites on saber sim here type of lineups that we're getting it is giving me stacks of five three mostly um some five two ones uh, but like you said, like Sheets always talks about, you're getting some extremely low owned plays in there, one to three percent guys, you know, that are, it's early projections. But Sabersom has it all in there right now. You guys can start doing research on the teams using our tools. We'll have our core plays up there, guys. And we'll give out some of our hand building that Bobby just talked about. We're going to be posting some of our stacks, our top pitcher plays, and then, um, just take those teams that we do and, you know, do a two, four, six hitter or seven hitter, and then just kind of get different like that with your roster construction. And if everyone's playing, you know, like different guys and we, we play some less guys of that stack, but you're still getting pieces of it. Like Bobby talked, maybe he takes two outfielders versus all the infielders on that team that everyone's chalky on and the outfielders hit all the home runs. And then you're on a different five man stack, but you got pieces of the chalkier stack that are still going off. So, I mean, I kind of like those models. We build a lot of like, you know, I don't play a lot of lineups, so maybe one to five lineups. Sometimes I do some small NMEs and stuff mm -hmm. and small satellites. If I'm playing for a lot of small dollar tickets, I'll mass a bunch of lineups out there. But I'm still technically going to stack these these smaller stacks. I use any hitter and the nine hitter a lot, actually, probably. Mm -hmm. And then um, <clears throat> just get different with some of that value. And um, just I use a lot of their projections. And Saberson looks like they're going to be – a a good tool to utilize here to look at different ownerships, different stack combinations for the satellites when I can choose those settings 
on Saberson because you got GPP single entry. You guys kind of create your settings and then you can change your exposures and how you want your stacks. If you want a little bit more of this stack or a little more of that stack, I think you can add that right in your exposures and then you can be able to get more of that team. And so maybe it's a lower owned team and you're get, not getting enough of it and you want to up it a little bit. So I yeah. definitely like Saber Sim guys. You can check us out, um, jump into that. We'll have our core plays on there. And it'll be every day for baseball. It's going to be a good time. FanDuel, DK. So ready for the season for sure. We're going to probably, if not us, um, I'll do it. But in addition, I think that Saber Sim is going to do it with you guys also. Yeah, we we're planning it for a totally, totally separate video on just how to use Saber Sim for for um for for building baseball lineups and i'm not i'm not singling them out just because you know because we have a relationship with them and that they're better than our rotor grounders but i feel as though again i've used them both and i think that if you're really going to use like saber sim to build lineups you you really have to get a little bit of an education on it because a lot of it is not intuitive and a lot of it you know you, you run the risk of like of, of, of not taking advantage of, of the uniqueness of the product. If you just kind of just treat it like another optimizer. Um, so it's going to require like a little bit of education for people. So, so I would encourage you guys, like if you just at our site for the first time and say, Oh, this is what Samson, you know, whatever, I'm just going to just, I'll figure this out. I used to use a, you know, fantasy cruncher. I'm just going to build some rules and just kind of hope this does the same thing. It doesn't. It's not. It's not the same thing. It's not like a calculator that's going to just, just, just you know, throw out lineups based on median projection. It's it actually runs simulations that, and, and depending on what type of sliders you set and what you tell it to do, what that that'll determine what types of lineups you get. You know, and it's like it's like any other computer. You know, like like people say, oh, the computer told me this. The computer didn't tell you anything. A computer is not a brain. It just freaking, it just, it just does what you tell it to do. And it just motors, you know? So if you're not careful, if you tell it to do the wrong thing or something that's not within its realm, I mean, you, you run the risk of, of not taking full advantage of it. So I do encourage, that's a long way of saying that we're going to, we're going to provide specific content on how to use the different tools that we have to build lineups, because you don't use, I wouldn't build lineups using Roto Grinders HQ the same way as either right. use Saberson. And I and and actually there's a little bit of subtlety you could use if you use fantasy cruncher, you know, with the randomness that's a little different than the other than those two. So if you start to become that guy that relies on optimizers or at least uses optimizers to help, you know, it's really important to know what what you're getting involved with with each particular one. Um yeah. so so I don't know, I just figured I'd just throw that out there. It, 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 my, my short way of saying that we have a lot of education out there for you. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's a really and I'm looking forward to doing that. I did want to use a couple of examples of other ways you can get creative in your stacks. And, and so you take the St. Louis, you know, let's say St. Louis with the highest run total, you want to stack St. Louis on day one. Um, makes sense, all this stuff. Um, the guys are expensive. There's, you have some issues there. The one really obvious thing you can do is you can stack St. Louis, play neither of the second basemen. Um, you have a minimum cost option who's probably going to be popular. And you have Tommy Edmond who's probably going to be less popular because he's 5,800. But you can just, instead of playing the Nolan Gorman, you can use a 2K guy like Robinson Cano, who's 2K also for because he, well, he hit last year, and play that full St. Louis stack, a, fi a full five-man any way you want to, but play Robinson Cano as your second baseman. You know what I'm saying? Because most people are going to either pick the leadoff hitter or they're going to pick the cheapest hitter as a part of their stack. And if you want to get different, that's one very basic way you can get different within while playing the most popular stack. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing I love to do in these things. I really, really try to do that as much as possible, especially as it relates to minimum cost guys. If I can take the minimum cost guy out of my stack, now it's nerve wracking because if that guy has a game, everybody else who has that stack is going to have that guy. But if I can then take that my other favorite minimum cost guy and play him as, and instead of that guy in my stack, and sometimes I'll do it and just leave it as like a 4-2-2 or something like that, leave one of those other guys like that um, or a 4-3-1 and have that one play, my favorite play, and skip the guy, but most of the, a lot of the time I will go with a five man stack and just make sure not to play the second base because most people are going to play the leadoff hitter or most people are going to play the cheapest hitter. Simple as that. If you skip both of them and put another minimum cost guy in that spot, you're going to be differentiating for yourself from probably 75 to 80 percent of the lineups that are stacking St. Louis. Um, just as an example, I don't have a whole bunch of other stuff to, to especially go through or look through. I do think, as we talked about before, just reminding. 
the, the most accurate uh, projection in baseball is going to always be the pitcher where they're going to come closest to their expected, you know, number. That doesn't mean they're always going to, but they're more likely than anybody else in baseball to, because you might have a hitter who's projected for 10 fantasy points. It's going to be zero or 20 most of the time, you know, or for two to 20. Um, but Rody, just, just drop on in if there's any other things that maybe I'm not missing or, or sheets on, on the pitching, on the, on the stacking side of things on, you know, favorite one-offs are, are usually pretty, pretty easy to find. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's really depends on the slate. And you take I, this I, 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 have, I have a question. So, so this is, this is, I ask it every season to you at the beginning of the season. When I first learned how to play baseball, I asked you this. I asked you this literally every single time this, this kind of thing shows up. So invariably you'll have, uh, you have matchups where you'll have a, a really crappy pitcher against, for example, a really crappy hitter against a really crappy hitting team, excuse me, a really crappy pitcher against a really crappy hitting team. And likewise, you'll have sometimes a really great pitcher against a really good hitting team. Okay. The question I have is, 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 is what do you, is what do you do? Like you, let's say I'll take Matt Harvey as an example. Okay. Just what, I don't even know if he's still in the league, if he's still mm -hmm. bad or yeah. whatever it is, but let's say Matt Harvey, what team does he play for? I don't know who he's on right now. I, he so, plays Baltimore so, let's, so let's say, let's say, let's say he's, he's, he's against them. He's pitching against the Marlins. Okay. For example, and let's just say the Marlins is the worst hitting team. Would you be more inclined to, to say, okay, we are going to attack Matt Harvey today. So who's, who's going against Matt Harvey? Ooh, the Marlins are. So the Marlins are all cheap. This is an amazing stack. Let's go after that. Or, or do you say, wow, we, the Marlins are an incredibly poor hitting team. Who can we get for value against them? Oh my God, Matt Harvey's really cheap against the worst, the worst team. I guess what, what I'm asking, I know the answer is probably some degree of ownership or whatever, mm -hmm. but like what, but like what wins out, you know, the immovable force against the immovable, you know, the impenetrable object, you know, will, will, will good hitting overcome good pitching? Like will bad pitching be good enough to be bad hitting? What you, what do you usually think about in, in those well, types of matchups? That's a really interesting question on a lot of different levels. I mean, one very basic way is if I'm going to play 10 lineups, 10 lineups that are similar value that night, and I'm going to have, and I, and I, and I want to, and I want to play some of the Marlin stack, but I, I and, and there's, you know, not a lot of good value at pitching. One of those 10 lineups is going to have Matt Harvey as the pitcher. So you're sort of hedging, you know what I mean? And, and I do, I do quite a bit of that. Um, so that's, that's, that's the first part, but it's really confusing um, to try to figure this out in a general sense, because I struggle with it. It's every day is different. And it, you're right. It's the most important thing usually is dictated by ownership. Um, uh, you know, the, the park factor, but the way I, I, I find it that I use things the most is I am more than happy to take, to take hitters, sing one-offs, one-off plays against Max Scherzer, against even Verlander to some extent, less so Verlander, less so Bieber, but the oh, guys who, oh, for sure, the Robbie Rays, because you want, you want to, you, you go for the home run power, especially if those guys are going to be popular and then you're, you're getting leverage against the field, but on top of it, but you're, and then you're also having a very low owned great hitter who, you know, if one hey, Scherzer is not going to pitch every, all of his at-bats and Scherzer gave up the most home runs in the, in, in the league last year. So you want to try to pick on some of these, these, these really top level guys, if they are the ones who give up power. And if there's a certain matchup you like, maybe you've got the uh, platoon split, um, a lefty and look, trying to think of who's on Washington, like a Soto, Soto against Scherzer would be a great example. I have no problem. I don't care who you are as a pitcher. Juan Soto Austin is the best Cruz. What's that? Nelson Cruz there. Power Nelson Cruz too. Yeah. But I'd be, I'd be, yeah, then I'd, I'd probably do that, but I usually would try and make sure I got the best hitter, which is by far, I mean, again, I'm going to, you're going to hear the, a lot, a lot of Soto, Soto talk yeah, out of yeah, me yeah. this year. What's that right, Rudy? You know, you know, yeah, you're going to pay, you can pay up for Soto in that case. Yeah. Like, to go against Scherzer there. You know, you know what you brought up, Bobby? Let's talk about this for a second. You brought up a really important uh, term that's used in all GPPs and that that's leverage. And what's cool about baseball is lever leverage comes in, 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 in different ways. So like, let's say that let's use your example. Let's say Scherzer is, is 10 K. Um, and uh, let's, let's just say he is, let's say he's 10 K facing the nationals. For mm -hmm. example. Um, and let's say that Scherzer is going to be popular at 10 K facing the nationals. Maybe that's not the case, but let's just say he is. So leverage in baseball comes in, in many different ways. So, so, like I would say to people, pause the video and then think of where can you get leverage against Scherzer and then start again. So there, there are a couple of ways you can get leverage if you want against Scherzer. 
if you feel like it. Number one is the most direct way is to to take the nationals, right? To take the nationals because that's the most direct leverage. But leverage is kind of funny. The other way you can get leverage against Scherzer is by taking another 10K pitcher, for example, you know, and that's getting leverage that way. And another way you can get leverage is taking a just different tier of pitcher. You know what I mean? Completely. So I don't, so I, I feel it's interesting when it comes to leverage because you have the pitching, you have direct leverage against them that you could play, but yet you could also take kind of like price leverage, take the same type of dude, you know, mm-hmm. or you could take, you know, just leverage against that whole price tier. You right. Know what I mean? Right. And somewhere else. So that's why I think baseball is kind of cool like that. I, I totally agree. And I think it's really interesting. Um, and it, it, you know, it led me to another interesting thought about, you know, when are we supposed to take the gambles on the pitchers? And the answer is very simple on this. You want, you obviously want them to face to face a, facing a bad team. Um, but you look at, so Robbie Ray and Max Scherzer realistically have basically the same seal as the truth. Um, it doesn't matter that the price that they, 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 Max, uh, Robbie Ray is 4,400 cheaper. He's projected within one point of him. And yet he's actually going to be lower owned than Scherzer is. Those are situations you want to attack. Um, you want to, you want the high, high variance at the same time, I will say, like, I'm looking at this particular slate and anytime you give me any lefty, but I, I'll take anybody right lefty, righty, but a lefty that gives up power, their problem is that they, they give up power and stolen bases and they've got Byron Buxton at 5,400. That's going to be an automatic play for me. That guy's going to be probably in 30% of my lineups Anytime that situation comes up, regardless of how good that pitcher is, because it, if the guy does give up power and stolen bases, Byron Buxton is going to take off every time he's on base. And if you make a mistake, he's the guy who's going to make you pay. So those, those are the kind of things, you know, ways you could k- kind of get. And, and it's funny, Robbie Ray is, you know, a Cy Young winner and he's priced at 6,300 and everybody thinks it's a fluke season and all this. It's not. The guy always has upside. He happened to put, put together a nice stretch last year and the toughest park in baseball to do it. And uh, there's no reason why you shouldn't be playing him over Max Scherzer in spots like this, in my opinion. Um, I know that's sort of a little bit of a tangent, but. I think it's interesting. There's a lot of different ways to look at this stuff. It'll be a lot easier when it, when it's slates that I'm really familiar with and we actually know for sure who's playing. These are all projections, of course. Um, but I did want to mention one other way to get different in stacks that I sort of failed to before. Using two players with uh, players with multi-position eligibility. Let's say you have a second baseman and one has first base and second base eligibility. One has uh, just first base eligibility. Play those guys together. Try to do that as much as you can. You don't have to do it, but it's, it's a good way to get a little different because that means you're locking up those two spots and most, a lot of people who are building their stacks are going to include other players and not, and make a decision between those guys. So you're just another way to get a little bit different within the stack. Rody, does this make sense to you? And talk yeah, a actually, about any I, lo- I love that. Yeah. yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Any other things that, 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 that you want to maybe drop in? We, we'll keep going as we go. And you guys feel free to throw questions out and give us some ideas in the discord. Give us some ideas personally. You can DM me. Um, but we're trying to cover this as, as well as we can. And one thing we're going to start doing that Rody and I talked about last week, uh, she tweeted and talked to do about it, but we were going to do like a, a round table session, sort of we, we discussed a while back, uh, a round table discussion once a week and just sort of do some lineup review, maybe some ways we could improve the way that some of the, you guys are making lineups. And it'll be a, a discussion and, and like sort of like a, a coaching session, but where we're all sort of helping each other. And we're going to try and do that once a week as the season starts. So next, the first one would probably be next Thursday, I think. Um, but it's tentative right now. The play that we don't know the exact time and date. We'll let you guys know about that. But I think that'll be a really good, helpful way to try and go through it's like going through hand histories in poker you know when you're trying to figure out how good somebody is this is the way you this is a way you could go back and reconstruct and go oh well maybe this doesn't make sense that you included these guys in this case because you had a better play there and just because he fits in your stack is that the right thing to do if he's going to be 30 percent owned you know there's a lot of just general questions that are hard to do hard to get to while we're using this still as just a an idea concept rather than using actual results hey i've been i've um uh, I have another question. So we, we don't talk about this at all in baseball. Is it, it, I don't know if it's relevant or not, but I know that the NBA is just a freaking injury crap shoot, crap shoot. Right. And, and all through the night you get, you get news and all this stuff. We never really talk about, um, about late swap in baseball mm-hmm. because it's not often that something happens that, you know, that, that causes that, but I mean, it's gotta be worth, keeping an eye on right if you get like lineup changes in the, in the dodger game or lineup changes or whatever um how important number one is is you know reserving stuff for late games in baseball you know uh for for that type of thing and second of all 
we, we, we will always think, say to do this in football and basketball, but we don't really say to do it in baseball yeah. about, about if your lineups are not going as well as you plan, maybe you should take some of your exposures in your later games and kind of juice it up a little bit. Because remember in baseball, I mean, it's just baseball, you know, like if you have like a, a, a high owned Mike Trout, you know, it, 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 in, in the late game and you, and you're, you know, and you're struggling, just swap them out for anybody. You swap know them out, mean? leave money on the table, take the lowest owned guy with power upside. That's what you do. That's the way you do it in baseball, in my opinion. Now it's not as vital to have guys in later games. I don't think that way in terms of, in terms of my baseball lineups, but when I do have the, uh, the guys who are in the later games, like, like you, you just use Mike Trout. That's the best example because that's the most common one that comes up, right? So I've won, I won a tournament two years ago where I swapped from Mike Trout to, I, I want to say it was somebody weird, like it wasn't Ian Kinsler, but it was somebody bizarre uh, right. in a later game. And, and I ended up, uh, I think I might have even been on FanDuel, and I ended up winning six figures because I uh, can't remember who it was. Let's say, let's say it's Ian Kinsler, Kinsler for argument's sake. And he had two home runs and Mike Trout actually hit a home run, but I wouldn't have won the tournament. I would have come in like fifth or sixth place. I knew that the other guy who had, the, the, it went, this is a, a lineup that I actually had uh, duplicated. The guy had the same lineup as me. And I knew that the only way that I was going to be different was if I'm going to have to make that switch. That's the kind of stuff I'd look out for. And that's, then you have to decide, do I want to make that move? Because I've also had one where I would have won had, when I, I, I ended up not taking Mike Trout out, left Mike Trout in my lineup and said, okay, you know what? If I finish third or fourth, that's fine. It's a good payout on tonight but I didn't play for the win and everybody else who was relevant because it was the, it was like an ISO late game. Every other game was early. Um, and, uh, and it, it, so it, it, it always, it's different on every night. It depends on what you're trying to do, but I, in general, play the guy who's lower owned. No, none of these hitters are no, there's no such thing on a given day of anybody being twice as good as someone else in baseball. Try to find the power upside guy who is going to, you know, who you don't even care about actually you don't even care about that. He's low owned so much because you're leaving a thousand or two on the table. You know, if, you, if you're struggling early, if you're struggling late and you've got Goldschmidt in there who's projected to be 11% owned, well, just drop him and play Jared Walsh at 3% instead and leave the money on the table. You don't need to try to fill out your full salary. Um, baseball is the sport. Above all, you definitely do not need to use all of your salary. I still use within 500 usually, but I don't, I don't feel like it's, I have to, and I'm very happy to make a pivot and leave money on the table at the end of the day. How do you treat that situation, Rody? Yeah, I definitely like a lot of times I feel like I get to use all my salary, how my stacks work out. But yeah, I've left, I left money on the table. Love the idea of the late swap, changing the guy like that. If you're, if you're duplicated or, you mm -hmm. know, like you, you think you need to make a move to get you to first place. I've made, I've made some swaps like that, trying to give myself a little bit more leverage to get to the top. You know, um, I also like doing what we just talked about with sheets uh, on FanDuel specifically. If people are playing, paying 11 K for that pitcher, and I dropped down to Aaron Nola for 9K one, one tournament. I got a few more hitters. I was able to get some Houston and Toronto big bats, and I played a cheaper pitcher. I took down 100K with that turn in smaller yep. field. Every 50% yep. of the people were on the 11K pitcher that sucked, and I got a 9K. I got 2,000 more salary to spend. I could upgrade my bats. So on FanDuel, that's really good to get different, get that 8% guy that goes off for 60 and, you know, you got other pitchers there at 40, you know, 45, and you got, you know, points up on the, on every other lineup out there. So yep. just get those big games and get different with that leverage. I really like some of those calls that Bobby and Sheets just talked about. Well, uh, to, to, as far as the leave money on the table, again, not to turn this into a whole saber sim thing, but, but <laughs> one thing that, again, especially on FanDuel, I don't know if it's different this year. That's another thing you're going to, if you play saber sim, you're going to have to get used to you're going to get some lineups that that are going to leave like an ungodly amount on the table and you're going to have to really either embrace it or 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 not embrace it and make a rule to to forbid it um on FanDuel especially because what happens is is this is 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 you'll you'll set it for like max correlation or whatever it is and it'll give you like a bunch of four fours and what it'll do is if you prioritize it for upside and stuff like that and stacking and all that stuff, it will prefer a 4-4 four, four stack with like fishy players to a 4-3-1 when the one is Mike Trout for the same right. salary. You know what I mean? Right. Um, uh, just because it's like I said, it does what you tell it to do. You know what I mean? And 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 you're and if you're if you're playing it for upside for simulations in a simulation, it's gonna say, okay, this is you're gonna want this lineup if all these freaking guys from the Mariners go go go, go off. You know, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Are they going to go off a lot? No. But mm-hmm. but so but so you're going to get like you'll you'll be able to see you're going to you'll see your 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 your, your lineups. So you're going to say, boy, I'm leaving fifteen hundred on the table, and I could swap out um uh what's his name uh Cole Tucker for Fernando Tatis. Right. Why don't I do it? Right. And, and, and you, maybe you do do it, but but yeah. but 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 you'll see that you'll get that sometimes. Yep. Like if you tell it to build you pretty lineups, it'll build build you pretty lineups. You know. Right. Um, so so you know again, this is you know you have to you have to you know do some quality control, you know, and say, listen, uh, I'm not going to go down like that. I'm not going to have Cole Tucker instead of Fernando Tatis just because this gets me a four four. You right. know. Um, right. On the flip side, if you if you started a pitcher in the early games and those guys are playing in the late right. games. Then and then your pitcher gets shelled. I, I mean, I, I had this happen where I finished second in the in the big one on FanDuel for for like 50k a couple of years ago, where I had a, a negative 16 from Tyler Glass now, and he was two percent owned, and all of the other pitchers had seven innings, 10ks, 11ks, and I had no chance. So I just completely went dumpster diving, put all the 3k guys, and two of them hit three. I mean, it was just that baseball is a, a weird game. Lewis Brinson hit three home runs in two different games in his career. He also had went, went a whole season and hit two. You know what I mean? Like it's very hard to, to you're going to have some weird outliers. And when those things happen, you want to try to play for that. But it, let's just say you had that same situation come up sheets and you're, and you're, everything's, you're cruising along. You're going well so far. Your pitchers are doing well. And you've got these two guys later in the, you, you've got your four man stack later. Maybe you do want to go switch over to Tatis in that situation. Right. Like if, if, if you've got the money left on the table, you can go and that's when I think late at late swapping can make some difference too. I mean, um, I mean, I mean, meanwhile, I mean, I did build some like some phantom just to just to test my 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 sheets and stuff. So, so some lineups here, and half the guys are out that that I have in my lineups. I think, right. um, but I'm just looking look at some of these lineups, and and boy, oh boy, these Astros. I mean, they're just freaking scary, man. They're the same dudes, you know. What I mean? Some of them, like I don't know all of them still. Uh, hey, hey, sheets. Just what I do. I'm fine, and I just update my minimum salary to what I like. So if you just change your minimum salary. You know, to something like more comfortable, you're not going to get a lot of those crazy. No, I, I, but, you're still getting three percent guys. I, I kind of embrace it though. I kind of, I kind of live with it sometimes. <laughs> no, I know. I bet you just leave it there, and you love these. I seen that one NHL lineup you posted. It was like all one to three percent owned guys. I don't even know how much salary. Leaving like two thousand. Leaving like two thousand. Yeah, the see, table. so you're <laughs> loving just leaving all this salary. And, I, and I, me, I, I'm I, over I, here I, like, oh, I gotta yeah. get closer to fifty. Wait, but wait, but wait. So, so let, let me talk about leaving my other table. Okay, so so what I will I say the same thing is that if my, by my normal process, okay, there's money left on the table. I usually do not mess with it at all. What 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 is interesting is at what slate size do you force yourself to leave money on the table for the for 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 the. Uh, for, for uniqueness. Like, so like you could make the case that in showdown slates in football, for example, you want to leave money on the table, showdown slates in basketball, you, you force it to leave money on the table. Um, you could argue that, Ooh, you, I'm bringing up a good point. Hold on a minute. That in, in smaller slates, maybe you want to force leaving money on the table to avoid duplication, but it brings up an interesting point. Um, we didn't talk about this for in lineup building about using opposing uh, players in the same lineups with your pitchers. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned like, Oh, well, I'll, I'll take hitters against Gary Cole, whatever, but, but, but at what's, and I'm, the answer is going to depend, but you got to think about, you know, what slate size you're going to feel comfortable checking that box, allowing pitchers against, uh, against hitters and, and, and vice versa. Like if you say, for example, I think it defaults to allowing it when it's like two games late, two games or less or something. Yeah. I forget, but, but, you know, I would I, let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. At what slate size do you normally kind of start thinking about it? And second of all, you know, what types of, of players do you want to go against pitchers? Do you want to just be power guys? Do you want to be cheap guys? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think four games or less, but really it's probably three games or less. Um, that's probably the better natural rule to set yourself with. And you want guys who either are cheap and can steal bases or somebody cheap who can hit a home run. It's pretty pretty straightforward for me, the guys who I'm going to take against my own pitcher if, I, if I'm on those kind of slates. Unless it's, it's a two-game slate and other people are going to take that exact same guy, then I might find someone a little bit more obscure. Um, Rody, how would you treat that on like a three-game slate, let's say? Yeah, I mean, you could do it on a three-game slate. I, I tried not to. I think even the smaller slates, like 
um, during the day, sometimes you see the like three to four games slates, or, like the afternoon slate or whatever. Yeah. I tend to take a, if a if a pitcher is like sixty percent, I tend to take the hitters on the other side. Right. And then I just not, don't fade that pitcher. Pick yeah. a different guy. Hope they get about the same points. And maybe that that team that's not as chalky for the hitters, they go off for they go off for seven eight runs. Maybe all you need maybe ten. Mm-hmm. You know, I I seen that a lot where the star pitcher in those early slates last year. I won one of the three 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 wild card uh, wild cats for 20k on the small day slate fade just fading the chalky pitcher yep. taking the hitters against them and it just worked out and i i won one for 20k that day so that was that was nice so yep absolutely and i you know you know we'll call this part two of three of we're still you know figuring our way out through this these are all going to be improved throughout time it's just the way that it is but i did want to make one more point about something that and it, I, I like what roadie was saying about the smaller slate but i think that one other thing you could do with those pitchers um, if, if, if there's a guy who's going to be crazy chalky and, and taking, if you're going to pick on a good pitcher, make sure that, the, that there's not an awesome bullpen behind him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't try to pick on the good pitcher from the brewers where you got the, you know, the bus bullpen and baseball coming in behind you. Just try to do stuff like that. Those little changes will go will help you go a long way. You know, t- uh, a couple of years ago when DeGrom was dominant and the Mets bullpen was lousy, that was the kind of guy who, if you're going to make that weird play and, and try and pick on a pitcher, you don't want to do it with DeGrom. So he's kind of a bad example. I guess use Syndergaard as an example when he was with the Mets then. That's the kind of guy you'd want to pick on, though. Or, or uh, when, when what's-his-name was having that great year, our, our, our lefty guy who we love to pick on, but sometimes we used, we used to play him. Um, I can't think of his name um, uh, for Detroit. I, for some reason, his name is escaping me. Matt, Matt Boyd? Matt Boyd, yeah. Um, but that would be a great opportunity to try and pick on a pitcher if he was ever going to be popular because you've got the worst bullpen in baseball behind him. So just make that that one motive. And guys, throw in any final thoughts here Beth, before we get out of here, because I, I don't know, um, you know, I, I want to get these more structured, but this is like a good first go through. I want to myself go through these videos and like improve them every few months or so. Um, but I don't have a whole lot else on my list to, to cover today. How about you, uh, Sheets? Any final thoughts, though, before we before we go? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I think we had covered, as I mentioned, I thought I knew that we'd cover more than you thought we'd cover, you know? Um, and, uh um, and I think that, that again, as it gets closer, what I'll do is, is depending on how it goes with the Saberson guys, what, you know, as they talk to you guys, if there's any more like educational stuff that I feel necessary, I'll, I'll, I'll do more, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and again, cause that's the reason I got into this in the first place. And, and, and the more of that kind of stuff I can do, uh, the better. Yep. Absolutely. That's great. And I do want to go more that direction in general with a lot of the stuff we're doing is really, and that's sort of that round table discussion thing. We're not here just to give you the plays. We're here to make you better. You know, that's the, that's the goal to get to be good at it. And um, yeah, Brody, any, any final thoughts before you jump? No, I think, I think we did good. That first podcast, we did a really nice uh, general, general talk about it. This time, I think we showed some optimizer. We talked more players, we looked at some of the teams coming up. We gave you more ideas on how to use these stacks, how to get different with some of this stuff, like go at the pitcher. So I think we talked a little bit more in depth in this video, and I think it was really good uh, as part two. And and we're, we're like Bobby said, we're here to make you guys better, better players, and like doing these same ideas that we're doing and how we're winning big tournaments. The, the, we're telling you what we're doing, how we're doing it, and taking the players. We're we're not just like, oh, here's our plays. No, we're showing you, hey, this is how I take the plays and this is what I do with them and how I get different with the plays or Mm -hmm. with the stacks that I like. Here's my stacks of the the night, but I'm getting different by taking some different hitters that aren't as high owned or or, or spreading them out a little bit instead of going one through four, one through five. I'm using seven, eight, nine hitter on this for to get low owned or something and get, or grabbing a power hitter at seven in the stack. So I think the video was good. I think our last couple of videos were made been good. I'm excited for MLB. And uh, I think let's just uh, get there. We're close. Yeah, guys, I really appreciate you guys uh, doing this. It's great. Uh, great. I'm really looking forward to the season and, and covering all that stuff with you guys. And uh, let's make a lot of money this year. And guys, any of the thoughts, please put it into the Drew, true DFS support channel. We are here to try and cover anything you want us to cover. So uh, let's get it as well. Oh, I, I cut, you know what? I got I got I got to stop it. Rody, you get to say it. You got to say it. All right, let's get it. All right. Good luck, everybody. We'll talk to you guys soon.